mentions about eating meat and the air. And then we have a connection with the Adelie all the is um it is uh so it's when you see yourself on camera you say I look like that wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. but you know, he say you say uh what cool you know but uh you know because you know the prophet alayhi salam, was salam, he looked at himself in the mirror one day and he said Allahumma ahsin khuluki kama ahsan khalki he said, oh Allah, perfect my character as you have perfected my form. So he must have looked at himself, admired himself, praised Allah for what he saw, and then asked Allah to make his character as beautiful as his outward form. When I look, I say, Allah, make my outward form beautiful and my character. <laughs> I said, you know what I mean? Um, but you know, th this relationship that we have with Jews and Christians is a special uh, relationship. However, many scholars are of the opinion that if there are marriageable Muslim women in one's locality that are single and available, it is uh, disliked, it is disagreeable for a Muslim man to marry a non-Muslim woman. And one of the reasons they mentioned for that is that it places the children in uh, a state of what they call attrition. Children are, you know, because I don't care what anyone says, we're gonna raise the children as Muslims. Or every, I mean, every child that has a healthy relationship with his or her mom has an affinity for the mother and probably an affinity for what the mother does, what the mother believes in. You know, in fact, I would, I would go as far as to say the culture of one's home is mostly defined by what the women of the household do. You know, of that domain, they are ruler. So if, you, if, you, if you're married to a woman who isn't a Muslim, I, 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 my, I, I think it would be very, difficult to raise your children as Muslims. It would be very difficult. I mean, it's already, if you have a, uh, you know, a wife that is a Muslim, it's already difficult, just given the world in which we live. So it would be increasingly difficult. So I, and, and besides, in my estimation, we are dealing with a full scale marriage crisis with women bearing the brunt of you know, most of that crisis. Uh, I, I think it would be, um, I mean, can't help who somebody feels attracted to or who they want to marry, but we do want to emphasize the responsibility that we should feel toward the women of our own community. You know, if, of course, I mean, if, if, if a man plans on being a good husband, now you plan on being a bad husband, we don't want you to marry the woman. You know what I'm saying? But if you plan on being a good husband, we would hope that you feel some responsibility toward you know the women of, of our community. I know what you want. This is like <laughs> you know what? I, I, I have I have my own. I have my own thoughts about that. Now these are just these, these are just literally like at bed, you know, in bed at night ideas. This isn't like from a like a traditional text or something like that. But I feel like when it comes to paternity, women have uh, a distinct um, you could term it advantage over men. Like, you know, if a woman, you know, conceives a child, carries a child for nine months, and then delivers that child, unless something is really wrong, she is almost guaranteed to be um, emotionally and spiritually connected to that child. 
you know, they used to say in our community, uh, mama's baby, daddy maybe. You know, that was that was that was that was a, that was a black saying, mama's baby, daddy maybe. Meaning the child's mother, you don't even have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. That's you know, that that's like a, that's like a solo connection. That stuff, you don't even have to worry about that. Like, you know, you know, like uh, there are uh, many women for whom, and this is why the Quran mentions the mother of Musa, putting Musa into the basket, putting the basket into the Nile, because the idea that a mother would ever leave her child in, you know, uh, 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 endangerment is like so far from like, that just doesn't happen. Yeah, I remember one brother, he was saying that, uh, SubhanAllah, Khalid Latif, the NYU, said that he went rock climbing or something like this, some, some activity in nature with his wife and one of his children, his son, I believe. All of his children, but the story features the son. And his son fell down and scraped his knee really badly. And blood was gushing from his knee. And he said that his wife was like hysterical, trying to, you know, find the, you know, the first aid kit, gauze to, to get the knee together. And since he's watching this blood shoot out of the boy's knee, like, like wrapping it. And he said that long after the situation was under control, he looked at his wife and he could still see her like trembling, you know, just because she was spurred to action by seeing her child in a state of discomfort. And he said it was at that moment that he understood the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that the Prophet is sitting with the companions and he said, you see this woman and her child? Could you imagine that she would ever hurt this child? And the companions said, of course not. Allah is uh, more loving to his servant than this woman to her child. Right? This is an authentic hadith. He said when he saw his, like just how, so my point in mentioning all of this is I think that both marriage and uh, a patrilineal, meaning lineage through the father. So all of my children have my last name, right? Um, I think it, 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 it tries to engender in fathers a similar kind of connection. These are my children, right? I have to care for them, which is one of the reasons why um, you know, marriage Islamically provides an indisputable proof of paternity. Like if a man and a woman are married and that woman conceives a child, there is no room for doubt unless he can substantiate that doubt with like real evidence. I saw a man leaving my house as I was coming home from work type evidence that I've, and I've never seen this man before. But it can't be just the features of the child are different. I'm dark skinned, my child is light skinned, or I have everybody in our family has a nose like this. This child does not have, you know, the Prophet would not hear anything of that, right? A man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, my son does not look like me, right? And he was um, raising some doubt about his wife's faithfulness. This, this boy, he's not, he's not from our tribe. Like he doesn't, he's not mine. And the Prophet Ali Sallallahu said, wait, do you, what do you do for a living? And he said that uh, I'm a shepherd. He said, if you have a camel and that camel gives, if you have a red camel, and it gives birth to a yellow cow. What do you say? We say that uh, it must have taken something from its its gene pool. Something you know, it's you know, it's it's a hereditary trait, but not that generation. But maybe somewhere in the hereditary line, there were yellow camels. He said, and likewise, your son. My point is, all of this indicates that men don't have that same uh, unshakable. 100% certain, this is my child. I'm emotionally connected to the child. Um, you know, th there is, I mean, I'm sure that you've, you've had parents that have been overwhelmed 
with their children and maybe have abandoned those children. But I'm willing to bet, and I don't have any statistics, this is just anecdotal. The overwhelming majority of absentee parents are fathers. I'm willing to bet that. I, I, would, bet my, I would bet my bottom dollar that the overwhelming majority of absentee uh, parents are fathers, right? I think marriage, the patrilineal kind of lineage, I think all of these are meant to, uh, just like in the, I actually think that this is the same reason for the, for the maha, for the dowry. I think this is the same reason for the dowry. I think a woman clearly doesn't have to give a dowry because just marrying this man, having a physical relationship with him, knowing that, that pregnancy is a possibility, it would serve to reason that she would be serious about this relationship. Like in this relationship, I could experience something that would be drastic, life-changing for me if I can see the child. So my seriousness is guaranteed, should be guaranteed. Like, it's clear that I'm not joking. <laughs> if I'm, it's clear that I'm, it's like the, for the woman, it's clear that she's serious because she could, she could conceive a child. The man on the other hand, we don't know if you're serious. You see, we, are you serious? We don't know if you're serious. So I think the dowry is almost a way of financially ensuring that there's some commitment and this is why, I, and this is why I always I tell I tell sisters, you should have some sense of the man who's asking your hand in marriage, his financial capacity. You have some sense of it if you don't know all of the details, and you want to ask him for an amount that he will regard as significant, not not impossible. Not like, you know, uh, I want 250,000. <clears> now for some people, hey, we want 250,000. If you got it like that, we can take it like that. I got two daughters, I've been practicing my speech. <laughs> if you got it like that, we can, if you got it like that, we gonna take it like that. Now, now, what if you don't? And the vast majority of people do not. Right? If you don't, we just want it to be, if you're, if you're a, you know, a person of very limited means, so how many love? When I got married, I was a person of very limited means. And I'm still a person of very limited means. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, it should be an amount that he regards as significant. You see what I'm saying? That this is, this is significant. This is, you know, I have made an investment in this woman, in this partnership, an investment that I am not going to very easily walk away from. You want it to be that kind of amount that I'm not just, I'm not just walking away from this. This is this is significant enough. I'm not just I'm not just you know, we need to, we need to get a therapist. We need to get some counseling. Not like uh, you know it didn't work out. I said, see if he can do that time, it's too low. <laughs> if he can wake up and just say, nah, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm too low. You went too low. It has to be something. He said, we have some problems here, but we got to go talk to you, man. I, I, you know I. Is is I made a significant investment here. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not just I'm not just walking away from this. You know, right? So I think all of these are. And this is just a theory of mine. I think all of these are ways of trying to bring men to the same level of skin in the game as women naturally have. Meaning, women naturally have more invested because of pregnancy, because of the potential of, you know, child rearing. There's, they're already like way up in terms of like how serious they are about this, how committed they are to this. I think men have to, you know, I think the Sharia is creating a, a means of men, you know, being bought in in the same way. Uh, the other thing that you have to remember is that Islamic law also permits polygyny. So men can have more than one wife. Which means that as long as all of those children are his children, they are siblings. But if, if the connection was matrilineal, then they wouldn't be siblings because they have different mothers. So, as, so it's, 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 it's kind of like, um, uh, 
And also too, the patrilineal uh, kind of lineage, it also betokens his financial commitment to his children. You know, like, like and this is where, you know, American civil law in most states and Islamic law gets really interesting. See, in American civil law, the, the parents are jointly responsible for the financial expenditure of, you know, the, you know for the children. In Islamic law, the man is solely responsible. The woman doesn't have any financial responsibility toward the children. In fact, the man's responsibility toward the children is so complete in Islamic law that if uh, he divorces a woman and she's still nursing the child that they share, he has to pay for her lifestyle entirely for the entire duration of the period that she's nursing the child. This is just to facilitate the nursing of the child, right? Now, in American civil law, they're jointly responsible for the child, but the higher earning spouse is responsible for the other. And I will talk to a lawyer, I'll talk to Eskimo about snow. I'm embarrassing myself. I'm embarrassing, I'm humiliating myself. No, but the higher earning spouse is responsible for you know, balancing the scales of the other. You know, Islamic law really didn't have a concept of, of alimony. Uh, but I mean, there's, there's ways that we try to, you know, do what we can. Yusuf, you had a question. So I've heard a number of people sort of say, oh, well, I've seen far too much are integrated about being fair. It's like a defect in faith, which would accept a similar amount. Um, Fatima asked for so much or so much. Does this woman think that she's better than, than the prophet's daughter? I realize you're sitting here with your wife. I don't, I don't want to start in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to start in trouble. Now. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, well, look. Like, it seems like a lot of people kind of weaponize this one way or another. So I'm just kind of curious. No, I, I, I mean, again, I think a, a dowry is definitely symbolic. And I think that it, 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 it's a great opportunity for a woman to show. Um, mercy uh, to show um, character because in, in this position she's been given uh, a position of unchallengeable advantage you know she can just say what she will accept and what she will not and you know and there's no uh, limit it hasn't been limited say no I'm not even a Qatar wanted to limit it you know Muslims came into this is a direct this is a direct reference to, to what you're, 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 you're mentioning. You know, Muslims came into a lot of wealth during uh, uh, the Khilafah of Sayyidina Omar. Many women noticing the abundance of riches, they're, they're watching the, uh, the stock ticker tape. There's, okay, there's a lot of money out there now. These dowry prices gotta go up. <laughs> and, 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 you know, all the stuff our grandmothers are talking about, they accepted, you know, it, it's going up. Sayyidina Omar, he, 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 he didn't like this. He thought this is like a violation of the spirit of dowry. So he stood up after a Juma and said, I am limiting the mahar to this amount. Then a woman that was a companion of the Prophet والسلام, stood up and she said, how dare you limit something that the Prophet didn't limit? He didn't put any limit on it. And Allah says in the Quran that if you had given a woman a valley of gold in divorce, you should not ask for a single cent back. Allah says that in the Quran, kintar, kintar, uh, kintar, like a valley of gold. And then Omar famously said, this woman is correct and Omar is wrong. So it, it ended up being this, uh, this display of his humility that this woman stood up and said, no, you're wrong. And he was like, no, no, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So it is also established that mahar really cannot be limited. Somebody can ask for whatever they want. Now, whenever, I'm, whenever my counsel is, is sought, I usually say, no, look, it's a great opportunity for you to show that you are also a team player, right? That you don't want to ask for an amount that will derail the family's, you know, like the family isn't even established yet. And you, of course, you want some financial security. You want some, you know, some financial floor. Why would you, you know, ask for an amount that would make it 
difficult. My suggestion is this. It should be an amount that the brother regards as significant. That, that has a lot to do with his earnings, has also a lot to do with his temperament. You know, um, for some people that I know, $500 is a lot of money. I, I know people for whom Bob, that's, that's a lot of money. And there's people that I know for whom $100,000 is a reasonable amount of money. I, I know people whose situations vary that greatly. I know people for whom, if, if you were to ask me, I would say $500. That would be an amount that I know, you know, if he has given that, this is a sure sign of his sincerity. He said, man, I get $500. That's just kind of, you know, this is just a financial expression of my commitment to, you know, your welfare, your well-being, you know, this relationship being present. I know, for, I know people for whom that's significant. And I know people for whom $500, they spend that at lunch. You know, it's like $500, that's not that. So it, all, it just really depends on, the, and I think both of them should be, are good men, should be married, but for the one that, uh, you know, probably a more reasonable dowry is $20,000. I, would, I wouldn't suggest that a sister marrying him except $500. And the one for whom $500 is reasonable, I wouldn't suggest that a woman would say twenty thousand dollars. He doesn't have that kind of money. He doesn't. He doesn't have that kind of money. That's not, you know. And it's also, it's almost like, like you know, people ask me all the time, would I allow my daughter, either of them, to marry someone who is poor? And my answer is always yes. My job is simply to explain to them what they're getting into. That you do know what this means, right? You know, I want to, and I, right now you're infatuated, you want a married brother. This means no vacation. You're accustomed to going on vacation once a year, or maybe even twice a year. That's probably not going to happen. This is what you're accustomed to doing your grocery shopping. And this is the way you're accustomed to doing your grocery shopping. You marry him, you probably want to do your grocery shopping like this. These are the kinds of cars that you normally ride in. These are the kinds of cars that you would probably be riding in. You might be taking the bus. This is the kind of health care that you're accustomed to. This is the kind of health care you might have as long as you understand that you're clear about them, this me love. He's got and he's got good character, good dean. This me love. And if she comes to me and says, you know, Dad, this is really hard. So I explain. I told you. you know, I, I told you what it was. <laughs> you know, I, I told you what it was. I told you. I said that was my job. I told you what it was. I told you. But you said you said that you wanted to do it. Now, if it's a situation where I think she really doesn't know what she's saying. Oh, I don't care about that. Yeah, right now, you don't care about that. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't care about that. Who cares? Like, who cares about that? And I say, right, look, after a, year of mar after a year of marriage, these conversations, they look a lot different. They look a whole lot different. It doesn't, doesn't matter at first. Oh, who cares? It's just money. Love conquers all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, after a while, it, it looks a little bit different. But it's my job to explain all of that. So I think. You just, I think it's important, especially in our time where we don't have a lot of community. See, a lot, a lot of this kind of Islamic marriage culture is contingent upon the idea of community. You see, if somebody whose family I know wants to marry one of my children, the thing that gives me the strongest vote of confidence is that I know their family. I know, I know this person's family. And there's a lot that I can do with that. I can, you know, I can research their background. I can kind of gather information about them. I probably would assume that they're very similar to me. So if, if, you know, his dad has been married for 30 years, his brother just got married a couple of years ago, he has a solid marriage, they're part of the community, his sister, she's married it would probably be reasonable to assume that this person has seen a lot of successful marriages, right? On the other hand, if that's not the case, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna say, no way, you know, your parents got a divorce and your brother isn't married, he's a player. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say that, but I feel strong knowing that there's a community around the person. The second thing is that 
in terms of behavior, this is, this is thinking about a, a man especially. You carry the reputation of your family. So if, if I hear, if my daughter tells me that you were uh, uh, abusive, that would be uh, a reflection. I, I hope you would see that as a reflection of your family. And if that would restrain you somewhat, right? You know, I don't, I don't want to embarrass, humiliate my entire family, right? In our context, a lot of people get married and there's a lot of anonymity. We, you don't know anything about this person. You don't even know where they came from. We met online. I don't, I don't even know this person. I went to meet their family and, and what I experienced was something like curated. It was set up. It was like, we went to a restaurant, his relatives were there, then we went and he introduced me to this person. But it's not like I saw this person come up in the community. It's like, you know, they, they clearly orchestrated the experience they wanted me to have when I came to Chicago, right? I think in that context, I think it's very important that um, we have some means of assessing a man's seriousness. Because as I was mentioning to uh, Sonia, I got a lot of friends and I love, I love them. But when it came to marriage, they just weren't serious. He wasn't serious. He wasn't serious. He wasn't a serious man. You know, I, I, I know somebody that's been married 18 times. You know him too. <laughs> you know, you know, 18 times, man. She get it. <laughs> 18, I, I know somebody been married 18 times, man. You've been married 18 times. <clears throat> I'm guessing it's not the variable, but rather it's the constant. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know what I mean? You've been married, you've been married 18 times. 18. What do you say to somebody who's interested in your daughter? He's been married 18 times. What does a woman say to a man that's interested in her? And she says, well, you know. How many times have you been married? 18. Do I think it is? Probably. Oh, Probably. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, what do you say? You've been married 18 times. You've been married 18 times. How do we ensure this now? If I'm this woman's welly, I'm trying to ensure her protection. How do I know that you're serious about this? You've been married 18 times. How, how do I know you're serious about this? That's what's like, man, we need some big money. You know, we need, we need some big money. How, how do I know you're serious about this? You know, so I think, I think in, in, in those kinds of contexts, um, you know, the diary becomes a very important tool just to engage, just to gauge and evaluate seriousness and commitment, man. Because no, nobody, nobody wants to be played with. Nobody wants to be played with. Nobody wants, you know, some, some, some relationships, they don't work out, but nobody wants to be played with. And I find that uh, women are very rarely playing, but men, sometimes they're playing. They're not, they're not serious. Man. They're not serious. So, some brothers are not serious. They're not serious. They're not serious. Yeah. So I think the, the patrilineal connection with the children, I think the, the dowry, I think the, um, um, you know, uh, I think all of this is trying to kind of, you know, make sure he stays, you know, connected and locked in. That's my theory. That's my theory. Yes. So we live in a context for the last 23 years where there is a doctoring model of well and quality, mm -hmm. both within this country and sort of globally. Mm -hmm. So I guess how um, do our legalistic traditions confront that? Well, to find dual things out of that, or people having uh, 
different arzaq or risk is something that you know has always been a part. It's something assumed by the Quran. I mean, you know, the Quran could not simply put, the Quran could not address poor people if they were not poor people. And um, this is this 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 sounds like a very straightforward point, but it's actually quite a deep um, religious insight that the Prophet وسلم, shows us how to live in a human, completely imperfect society. Meaning, like you know, some one like I, I read a. a I read a, a, a paper that a scholar wrote, and he said, you do realize that in Medina, right, the Medina of the Prophet, you have some people that were rich and some people that were poor. You know, the Prophet never said, everybody has to have the same thing. He could have said that. He could have said, everybody bring their wealth, and we won't leave until every Muslim has the same thing, right? This won't be a... Um, a moral society until there is absolute wealth equality. But he never did that, right? He never did that. Um, the reasons that he did not, um, you know, people speculate as to why he did not, but he never did that. One of the, you know, spiritual uh, impacts of him not doing that is that wealth is a test and poverty is also a test. This is something that God intends. You know, this is something that God intends. Now, the institution of zakat is actually quite brilliant in this regard. You know, zakat is something that, you know, it, it, it's an institution that is so brilliant that for me, it suggests that the way of the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is definitely divinely inspired. Because zakat is really just a wealth tax. Right? It's a wealth tax, it's not an income tax. It's a wealth Some people think of it as an income tax, it's not an income tax. It's a, it's a tax on the wealth that you have stored, that you don't use as a part of your, you know, it's not a part of your, your daily living expense. Many uh, Islamic scholars say, what that does is that it forces you to do either A, put your money into society through business, through investment. This investment will hopefully create engines of upward mobility for people that are impoverished. See, that's, that's actually, you know, one of the secrets of Zakat is to bring people from different ends of the economic spectrum into relationship with each other. See, when you think about what's happening in America, the wealth inequality, the wealth disparity is unprecedented. But what's also unprecedented is how far the communities are from each other. Meaning like you have people on the south side of Chicago, people on the west side of Chicago, they will never have any real relationship with somebody on the north side of Chicago that is in a different socioeconomic class. They're never gonna have we're never going to have any means of seeing each other's collective humanity. And this is why every comedian can get on stage. Every black comedian can say white people do this and black people do this. Because he doesn't really, you know, very few, the places that they encounter white Americans, even places of recreation, shopping, uh, movie theaters, places of um, employment. And, and that's a whole... That's a whole thing, right? But on a ground that is neutral, see, if, if I encounter a rich man at the masjid, it's neutral ground. This is the masjid. I mean, it should be neutral ground. You know, I mean, this is the masjid. Who cares if you're wealthy? This is the masjid, right? But this gives us an opportunity to create a connection with each other, right? Zakat is a way of fortifying that connection. That when you, when, you, when you give to someone from a different world than yourself, you're really um, fortifying 
a real connection with that person. You know, I'm a man, look, craziest things that ever happened to me. I was watching a lot of old black and white movies. I know you guys are Muslims and you don't watch movies. All right. I was watching these old black and white movies. And there was a type of hat that was very popular in the 1930s called a skimmer. It's a straw hat, it's flat on the top. It's also known as an Italian boater. You see people wearing them now like carnivals. It's like a it's a it's a it's a funny style hat. But I was like, man, that's a cool hat. I want to try and get me a skimmer. Right? This kind of this 1930s stuff, flat top, kind of tall crown, little short, little, little stingy brown. So I want to get a, I want to get a skimmer. I was standing on Division Street one day. And here comes a guy who appeared to be, you know, having a tough time economically, riding down the street on a bike, wearing a skimmer. Nice one too, made in Italy and everything. He comes right over to me. What about his hat? Oh Lord, what I see, man. These are things, man. I'm telling you, I'm sitting there watching the move, and I like one of those hats. I like one of those hats. And at the time, I didn't even know where I could buy a hat like that in Chicago. I said, I would like one of those hats. The next day, me and Jasur, this brother from uh, uh, Jeffrey Mount on the South Side, was sitting on division. It's late. It's like 11 o'clock. He rides right up to me and says, you want about this hat? <laughs> and I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, what you selling to me for? He said, 20 dollars. Right. I reached out my pocket, gave him a $20 bill. Took the hat. Right. Right, right, look, look, look. I said, man, I said, where did you get the hat from? He said, I used to shine shoes in a prudential bill. I used to be a shoe shop in the Prudential Bill. He said, some of the wealthiest people in Chicago, I've shined their shoes, coming in and out of Prudential Bill. And he said that in three years, none of them scarcely even like showed interest in me. He said, man, we knew each other. I mean, they knew my name, but beyond, hey, Joe, that was it. There's no, no connection beyond that. I was shining these guys' shoes every day. And he said that I mentioned to one guy, I said, man, you know, we see each other all the time. You've never even thought to ask about me and my family. He said, me and this guy ended up having a 45 minute conversation, this wealthy exec at Prudential. He said, at the end of the conversation, he took the hat off and gave it to me, walked upstairs. And that's how I got that. Right, right, right. He took that off and gave it to me, and now I'm giving it to you for $20. <laughs> but when he said that, it made me think about how it's not just wealth disparity. It's a social, this is a social issue. You know, like, I visited uh, rural southern Egypt. You know what shocked me about rural southern Egypt? Is that the wealthy, and I, and I was visiting one of the wealthier families you know, in this area called Suhag in Egypt. The wealthier families and the poor families, outwardly they live relatively the same. You wear the same clothes. You know, our dwellings look pretty same from the outside. So only when you go in the wealthy family's house, then you see. They got everything, you got TV, you got hot tubs, but from the outside, it looked just regular. You know what I'm saying? It looked just, just like everybody else's house. You got to wear the same clothes everybody else wears. And I realized that in their society, unity requires some restraint on behalf of the wealthy. Meaning like, in as much as we are one community, I can't go out and let my neighbor see. It would be like distasteful for me to display my wealth to my neighbors in a way that makes them feel like I have much more than that. It's like, only when you come into my house can you see, I'm one of the richest men in this town. <laughs> you, know, you know, this is why I can host you so comfortably. But they don't, they just think I'm just, you know, they know I'm wealthy, but it, there's, 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 
virtue and a certain kind of humility in, in expression. We live apart from each other, right? Everybody is in their own silo. And what Zakat does is it brings them into closer contact with each other. Once we are in close contact with each other, then partnerships go out of that. You got wealth, I got expertise. Let's form a business, right? You got wealth, I have labor. What can we, you know, what can we do together, right? Now, if that does not interest you, if, if, if investing your, your wealth in ways that provide opportunity for other people does not interest you, then we have to take more zakat from it. So it's got to get to these people one way or another. It can get to them through partnership and investment, or if you don't do that and it remains kind of sitting well, then we have to take it and just give it to them. So, you know, and 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 you know, in the Quran, you know, Allah Ta'ala mentions you know, you know, so that wealth is does not remain concentrated in the pockets of the wealthy. So it's not about demonizing wealth. Like you see at these protests, eat the rich. Right? It's not about demonizing wealth. It's about moralizing. You know, how do you moralize privilege? That's what I think Zakat is trying to do. It's trying, Zakat is just like one institution, but it's how do you moralize privilege so that those in possession of more see themselves as responsible toward those in possession of less. And this, uh, to my mind, kind of interrupts this extreme meritocracy. See, like, see, and this is where like, it becomes spiritual. See, we believe in this extreme meritocracy. So when we see somebody with less, we think they were less deserving, less worthy, less hardworking, less intelligent, less capable. They have what they deserve and I have what I deserve. That is from Shaitan. That is from Shaitan. This person has less than me because they didn't work as hard as I worked. They have less than me because they're not as intelligent as I am. No, 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 no. They might be more capable than you. They might be more intelligent than you. They might be more hardworking than you. Man, there was a girl that attended Marshall High School on the west side of Chicago. She was the valedictorian of her class which means she was the top student in her graduating class and she could not get an SAT score high enough to get into a four-year university. What did she do wrong? She was the top student in the class. The system failed her. She didn't fail anything. What did she do? What did she do wrong? So my point is that it wasn't, I mean, I bet she was hardworking. She completed her assignments on time. She managed her time well. She was in a bad situation. So we can't, we can't take this uh, extreme meritocratic approach that uh, what you have, you deserve what I have, I deserve. That's how it is. Although this is what America wants us to do. This is why there's so much, um, you know, all of these fake racist storylines. Oh, black people, they esteem uh, entertainers and athletes more than professionals. That's why they're in that position. Come on, man. You know, what, what one guy said, what 12 year old do you know? that says, I just idolized this accountant. Well, that doesn't happen. All kids want to emulate athletes and entertainers, white, black, Chinese. What, what, what 10 year old says, man, when I saw that guy with that stethoscope, man, just the way he pulled it out, 
No, he says, when I saw Tom Brady throwing, it, it, that, that's just a part of being a child. There's actually an article in the Wall Street Journal today, so the career that the most children and teenagers uh, are interested in is a physician or doctor. The number two is social media influencer. Yeah, which, <laughs> which, 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 which is just, you know, when, when, when you think about that, it's scary and it's kind of like obvious at the same time. It's obvious, but it's scary, right? So finishing your, finishing your, finishing your question, I think the Sharia tries to create um, relationships that can, um, you know, massage, ameliorate, you know, wealth, you know, inequality and wealth disparity. Um, and, and, and tries to bring us together in ways that we can recognize each other's humanity. You know, that, that poor people are not lazy and rich people are not evil. You know, not all poor people are lazy and not all rich people are evil. It's just the, 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 the hand that we're all dealt. You know, it's just the hand that we're dealt. Yeah. I kind of, I guess so, there's a sort of historical, Unprecedented with the weather inequality that's happened in the last 20, 50 years. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, I guess what's the what's the solution? Not necessarily what's the solution, but what's the um, where is the like the unprecedented aspect of it? I guess how do we? But yeah, that, that, that's a, that's a very deep. I don't know, man. It, it, it's deep. You know, I I, I do know. I don't want to sound like you know Thomas Friedman or some you know capitalist shill, but you know Islam does respect private property, and um, there's there's a specific incident from the life of the Prophet where there was a a man who uh, had a virtual monopoly on barley. People are in need of barley you know, to make bread. Somehow he did some kind of commercial maneuvering where he ended up with the vast, he cornered the barley market in Medina and he was Muslim. And of course, having cornered the market, he started charging more. He started increasing his price. And they came to the Prophet Ali and they said, he's price gouging. You know, force him to sell at a fair price. And the Prophet Ali said, Allah did not send me as a price fixer, right? Like Allah did not, like this I, uh, for all of my friends that have like, like really, really big socialist leaning, you know, it's like this, this, this story of the Prophet is it's like, ooh, you know, he says like Allah did not, like that's not my, almost like that's outside of my jurisdiction. To go to this man, to force him to sell his produce um, at a price, that he doesn't want to sell, it's not my, you know, but I will have him know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us to task for exploiting people. So he gave him a moral rejoinder, right? Like don't, don't, don't exploit people, right? But he didn't, and this is where this becomes, this actually really subhanAllah, he did not act in his capacity as the mayor of Medina. In his capacity as the mayor of Medina, he could have said, this is the price. You will sell for this price because I said so. But he didn't do that. But in his capacity as the messenger of God, he did warn the man that being exploited and in your business practice could lead to some reckoning on the other side. And the man started to sell at a fair price. The man said, okay, now that you mentioned me, I I don't want to get in trouble with Allah. I was just trying to make some money. You know what I'm saying? I was just trying to get my money up. You know, I, I'll sell at a fair price, you know. But he could have forced him to sell at a fair price. He said, Allah did not send me as a Messiah. I'm not a, I'm not, Allah didn't send me as a, a price fixer. That's not my, you know, that's not, you know, that's that's not that's not my vocation. Now it gets even more interesting. Because just because he didn't do it. Does that mean it can't be done, right? Does that, does that, does that mean that we can't um, 
levy certain kinds of other wealth taxes on the wealthy? Does that mean that we cannot um, um, uh, instate mandatory minimum wages and things and things of that that sort? Um, most of my teachers, you know, of course, now we're in constitutional law, will say, no, we can we can do those things, but we should be reluctant to do them, seeing as though the Prophet himself did not do that. That wasn't his that wasn't his his way to you know deal with the, the private affairs of people of people's private property. He gave the zakat that was issued by Allah, and then he left the door of sadaqah open and he encouraged people to give sadaqah. You know, Bill Clinton wrote a book many years ago called Giving. You know, he actually mentioned the organization Iman you know, in the book. Yeah, he called Giving. And although uh, the book is simple, right, the, the, the premise is simple, there is some, I mean, you know, when you, when you levy all kinds of, 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 of taxes and you try to force more inequality um, through um, you know, the, the forcible seizure of the wealth of the wealthy, which is the only way that it can be done, if we're, if we're, if we're being frank here, um, you end up creating uh, great, um, you know, I mean, historically it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't gone well. You know, if you look at, you know, uh, the trend, like this is the reason why Marx, Engels, Lenin, they say that initially the proletariat uprising, it must be very bloody, initially, before we reach like this communist utopia, the socialist utopia, to wrest their wealth away from them, they will fight you for it. They're not, you know, you know, they say, you know lives will be uh, sacrificed, you know, for that. And I think that, yes, I understand how in that ideology, this is a necessary to bring about more inequality, you know, um, to bring about more equality, excuse me. But trying to morally incentivize people to give, right? morally incentivizing them to give, and then implementing the zakat, right? The zakat must be given, right? For non-Muslims, the jizya, like classical Islamic kind of statecraft, the zakat must be given. And then we want to just incentivize them to give more of, of, of what they have. I think there's, there's great wisdom in that. I think there's great wisdom in that. If you look at zakat, I think it's, it's wisdom even in the, the amount being a, a nominal amount. 2.5% is not, it's not a lot. That's not, in terms of the person extracting the 2.5% from their wealth won't experience it as a burden, right? 2.5% annually, you know, so you won't, they won't experience it as a burden. But for people of great wealth, you know, like I didn't realize how wealthy even some Muslims are until I heard somebody say, every year giving this a cat, they have to give away $500,000. Every year, like he was mentioning that for the last ten years, he's had to give away five hundred thousand dollars of zakat. Now I'm not good at math, but five hundred thousand is two point five percent of what? Somebody tell me. Twelve point five dollars. Yeah. So about $12.5 million of wealth, he has to give away $500,000. Now we're talking about 12. We're talking about the person whose net worth, who had, whose accountable income is 12 million, whose accountable wealth is 12 million. What about people whose accountable wealth is 50 million, 60 million? This is, and this is, this is, this is, this is every year. Right now, now this same person, he hates income tax. Like, he, I mean, he has lawyers. He has accounts in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> He's doing everything he can to avoid his income tax. But is the cap? I know the man. Whenever Ramadan comes, 
He's looking for institutions, people that he can give to. Every year, I'm, I'm looking for people. So I know some people say, tell them where I'm at. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm looking for people. I'm looking for people. Because he doesn't regard that 2.5% as a burden. Well, it's not just the number. It's if you, are, Creative in terms of paying your income taxes to the government. If you're wrong, you could hire lawyers to defend them off or tie them up. If you're wrong in meeting your obligations to Allah, you're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No loopholes. You know, you know. Where's the loophole? You know, it, it, you know, it's like, you know, let me let, let me give what I'm supposed to give. So if, if you can, and this, I think this is really something we don't acknowledge it nearly as much as we should. You know, when I think about the prophets, I, was like, I always, I talk to my, my you know, uh, friends and people that I meet, you know, on my travels. And they always talk about revolution, a lot of, especially a lot of black folks, revolution, uprising, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And sometimes I have to rain on their parade a little bit. And I say, you have all of these demands. You gonna do this, you gonna do that. Mm -hmm. What incentive does a white person have to accept any of that? We gonna do this, we gonna do that. I want this, I want that. What, I mean, what, what, what? I mean, really, you, you really think that you loot a few stores and what happened after the George Floyd murder and you, you really and you really think that this is going to what? What, what do you think? Like how far do you think this is going? Not very far at all, actually. Just being, just being like, how, how really? I said, you know what's brilliant? Somebody that can create a movement that brings wealthy people and indigent people together, see each other's common humanity, and that relationship naturally produces upward mobility for those that are less fortunate. This is what the Prophet Muhammad did, You see, if you demonize the wealthy, the only thing you do is alienate the wealthy. If you demonize the wealthy, you alienate the wealthy. Oh, okay, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm, I'm evil and you're poor. We can keep it just like that. No, no, okay, <laughs> all right. I'm the devil. I devil with this money though. You know what I mean? <laughs> going about my business, going about my devilish business with this paper. That's where I'm going. But if you can create a system of values, right? Where people that have, like I said, out of the fear of Allah, they're looking to give away five hundred thousand dollars every year. I'm I'm looking for this is something I do because I I the government isn't making me. This is something I do because I believe in Allah. How do you inspire the conscience of people of wealth in that way? This, to me, is more revolutionary because it can actually succeed. You see, it can actually do something. You see? This, this, this is why I say, you know, as an organizer, as a social iconoclast, as the leader of movement, I would really like to see some of these revolutionaries study the seal of the Prophet and be open to what, the, what, what, this, what, what we're learning from the seal. It's like, well, you go ahead and demonize those people. Why would they help you? And, 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 and none of them want, I mean, at least like Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. I know you, I know you told me about that. But none, none of them really are asking for like a violent insurrection or nothing like that. The goal is really just to try and guilt just try and get white people. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't like this. I don't, that, that, I, there's something, there's something in my dignity that just, even if I was indigent, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not that kind of person. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna try and guilt you into helping me. Look at what you did to me, man. I'm a man up here crying. Can't you see how hurt I am? Can I have some money? I, I'm, I'm probably not gonna do that. But, to try and inspire, right? Inspire people of means to dig into the best aspect of who they are as human beings, to care for other people. I'll do that. So I, I, I speak fundraisers all the time. 
I'm not trying to guilt people. I'm trying to inspire them. I mean, give. Yeah. yeah. Right. So this is this this, this is a very ikhtiyari, um, a very uh, not forcible way that Islam deals with love and equality. You said you had a question on the back of his question. Oh, you're talking about the influence of this. You know, man, the influence thing is scary because um, in influencing, to me, it is the uh, the fulfillment of a capitalist dream or nightmare. I don't know. I don't know which one. But a private citizen is capable of being uh, a branding tool to help people sell products. And it's like, you know, I, like, like I honestly think, again, my opinion, man, that just dinner table, dinner table stuff. I think that's what drove Kanye West crazy. Man. I, I, I think, I, I, I think that's what drove, I think that's what, I think that's what really drove. People say his mom died. <laughs> No, I, I, I think that naturally, those of us that have lives outside of our homes, even me, there is a performative component to what we do. If you work as a lawyer, you work as a teacher, you work as a salesperson, you work as a preacher, there is a, and by performative, I don't mean artificial. I'm very serious about what I'm saying. I mean intentional. There's a performative, you know, I, I do realize that when I sit in this chair, I am, for that hour and a half that I'm here, forgive me probably an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> that hour and 20 minutes that I'm here, I'm representing something bigger than myself. I might be having a bad day. I might be spiritually struggling. But for that hour and 20 minutes, I am a representative of the tradition of the Prophet and I try my best to carry that when I'm in that seat. Now, when I go into my house, I have much more license just to really just be. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't even have to represent no tradition. To my wife and my children, I talk to certain friends of mine, mashallah, my brothers. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe a swear word slip out here, there. Here, there. You know, here, there. You know, just I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not under that pressure. I, I can, I can, I can only imagine what it means for the most sacred relationship in your life to just be a commercial tool. I feel like as long as you have some things that are real, you can deal with a lot of funky stuff. When it's like, man, I got certain friendships that are real to me. Others, you know, we got to do what we got to do. I mean, this, this is actually a certain measure of phoniness is a part of being a member of society. You know, you don't always feel like being polite. It's something that you have to do. But if everything is phony, I think that would have a disorienting effect on me. Like, like it would be like, like honestly, man, I, I feel like uh, I feel like I'm pretty grounded mentally. I feel like I feel like I'm on most days, you know. So I feel like I'm pretty, you know. I feel like I'm 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 pretty solid. But if if like my wife told me that, or I learned that the woman I thought was my wife was really a special agent, it was like a Donnie Brasco. She's really a special agent working with the. Uh, what was all the, uh, the counterterrorism thing for the Muslim community? She was really a CBE special operative trying to gather information on me, and this was deep cover. Having children, <laughs> you know, having my children living with me, this is really just deep cover. And now the indictment has been issued, and she's off to her next assignment. Now, it would be so just, I would be like, no, that. I'm sure it would drive me crazy. I would think, no, there's no way. Like, there's no way. There's no way that we share what we share. There's no way that all of this was a part of us. An assignment? 
I would be like, no, nah, that didn't happen. There's no way. There's no way. Then I think I would start thinking, well, what is real in life? If that's fake, this woman that I used to sleep next to, this she was a special operative for CBE. I, I think at that point, my life is my life is now out of control. Which is one of the reasons why. I understand why it takes some time for people when they see like their spiritual role model engaged in like a scandal. It's like people think it's all personality worship. No, no. And I try to help people through those experiences when they have those with their mashaikh and spiritual teachers. It's not just, it's deeper than that. It's like, it makes it feel like, okay, life doesn't make sense anymore. You telling me so-and-so is a child molester. This is my shame. Like, okay, life don't make sense. There's somebody I pray behind, I, you know, I ask to make you offer. Okay, life don't make sense anymore. My, my life, okay, what, what, what are we doing now? I think that Kanye West having a publicist curate his experiences with his children because they were, Kim Kardashian is essentially an influencer. This is all, this is all being curated. This is all being orchestrated. This is everything, right? This is all being orchestrated. And I actually could hear him breaking. Like this is all, this is, this, this is all being uh, engineered. This is all fake. This is all fake. And when he started grabbing for Christianity as a representation of something real, it started producing much tension. You know, and I heard him in some interviews saying things that like, hmm, this is before he really lost it. Before he really lost it, he was saying some things that were like, hmm, you know, um, he said something to the effect of, yeah, you know, your girl will do it for the gram, but will she do it for you? <laughs> right? Meaning like this whole uh, presentation that my wife is engaged in there's no interest in me. There's no interest in cultivating romance with me or intimacy with me. This is for her followers. She's, this, is a, this, is a, this is a kind of self-promotion. This is OnlyFans type stuff, man. This isn't the person that I'm married to. When he said, he said, yeah, girl, do it for the grand, but what she do it for you? And you can hear the sadness in his voice. Like, this, is all, this is all an act. This is all an act. This isn't real. But such is the... Uh, the lament of people in show business. And I just feel like the influence of stuff is dangerous because nobody's yelling cut. You see, there used to be a time when it was like, oh, you, know, you know, I put on my stage outfit, I put on my little stage glasses, they say action, and it's time for me to be that character. That's what I do for a living. I gotta be, okay, I'm, I'm the character. And then I leave the stage, I take off the glasses, I take off the funny suit, I put on my regular clothes, and I go home to my family or the people that know me, sit and watch a football game. But as an influencer, who yells cut? Does anybody say, okay, cut? No, it's, this is around the clock, 24 seven. So this, this, is, this, this is what you're doing all the time. And I think with Kanye, man, that joint, he was building a family with that in the backdrop. This is what we're doing all the time. I think that'll bring any, I think that'll bring any woman, bring any man. And this, this we're doing this all the time. This is all fake, man. So I worry about that. You know, I worry about now I know some people that work as influencers and they seem to have a good balance. You know, they seem to know how to, you know, cut it off. But, you know, I don't know. I I I'd imagine they'd have some weird moments too. You know, it's like maybe get into argument with their spouse at the restaurant and then tend to be having like, right now I'm eating at the lunch of a call. They cut the camera off. I hate you, I want a divorce. But this is the best chicken for me I've ever had in my life, you know what I mean? I mean, and, 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 but, but you gotta really, I mean, man, you know, a sustained period of that kind of schizophrenic life. I don't know, it's just not, it's just not, I, I don't know that, I don't know that human beings can bear it too much, too much. That's what I think about the, a lot of the influence stuff. It's too much, I don't know. But I mean, you know, hey, 
this is it now. I mean, like I said, it's, if you look at it, that's a capitalist nightmare. But a capitalist dream, we have turned into uh, money-making entities just by virtue of living. You know, man, it's, you know, it's crazy because uh, nobody would have guessed. You know, when I, when I read the book, Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, nobody would have guessed that they would ever have like a means of just advertising to us in our pockets all the time. Everybody was talking about the danger of watching too much TV. Now, the phone is just tracking everything you do when people are trying to sell you things. You know, today my phone did something, man, and I was like, yo, I gotta be more careful with this stuff, man. You know, I was talking to somebody about uh, a proposal that I'm putting together for uh, an initiative that I want to spearhead in 2023. And I said, let me find the document. Let me find the document. And then when I went to my email and just put search, documents just came up. And I was just like, that never happened. It, it, the documents never just come up. I said, let me find the document. So I went to documents. I'm like, man, this is, man, this is just, this is just too, you know, or, or and sometimes I think they're flaunting it. Like I get in the car, Equinox Gym, eight minutes. But how, how do you know I'm going to Equinox Gym? I mean, I am going to Equinox <laughs> you know Gym. How do you know I'm going, how do you know I'm going over here? I am going over here, but how do you, you know, uh, Doghouse, 25 minutes. Like, you know, how you know I'm going to doghouse? Well, I am going to doghouse. <laughs> you know it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, but it's strange, bro. This is, man, we live in some strange times. But on, on spiritually, I think this is the time to go back to a lot of those prophecies about the Dajjal and the end of time and just look at them. Um, Hopefully, you will read things that will still strike you as outlandish. See, I always tell people, man, you people, this, this is a branch of religious study called eschatology, right? As long as you're reading eschatol eschatological things and they strike you as so absurd and bizarre, alhamdulillah. Now, that's actually a good thing. When something, when it strikes you as bizarre, that's a good thing. Because that means you're not close enough to see it yet. It strikes you as like, what? Oh, that's that's crazy. And that's why I tell like whenever I'm teaching this, the ultimate inconceivable is the sun rising from the west. See, that's the ultimate inconceivable. That's the ultimate inconceivable. Like, no, that's kidding. But when things are so strange that that is now conceivable, now it's your own See, the more these things become conceivable. So, like, I think about us reading these things, and there's still some things that we're like, I can't even imagine that. Alhamdulillah. Think about people in the past. They would read things that we read now, like, yeah. And they probably thought, what? Like, that's it. What? How? what? You know, that the jail is going to have a device on his hip that will inform him of things happening around the world. How do you think the Sahaba heard that? Huh? It literally says his hip will tell him what's happening in different places, right? His hip is going to tell him what's happening. But now we, there's a number of devices that we can see that he, he can just carry it on the hip. Right? But the Sahaba probably heard that like, we believe it's true because the prophet said it, but we have no, we have no, what? When you start reading those hadith and you're not like, what? We know that we're getting close. We know that we're getting close. You know, when you start reading those things and they're conceivable to you, like, the one that always gets me, the Arabs of the desert, poor, barefoot, destitute, competing with each other and building tall buildings. The Sahaba heard that and like these people are Ill they're illiterate, they're, they're poor, they're building things, that's unbelievable. 
Now they compete with each other. Burj, Burj Khalifa, and then this, and then. <laughs> you know, here it is. Here it is. So I think that um, you know, we're just we're 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 coming to a a really interesting time, man. Really interesting time, man. Subhanallah. We're living in a really interesting time, man. You know, they say life has changed more in the last fifty years than it did in the previous two hundred years. Yeah. So I don't know. So yeah, I want to be an influencer too. This will let Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will ask us in the lesson of the course of in the Ladina and the Wa'ad the Salihat wa Tawaf al Haq wa Tawaf al Sabr. Subhan Rabbi ka Rabbi al Izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al Mursalin wa alhamdulillah wa bil alamin. So I gotta get, I gotta get, I gotta get, we gotta get the technical details worked out. Eighteen marriages, eighteen. Hey, look, and counting, and counting. 